Everybody, give it up for Michelle Gross. Oh, nobody needs to give up anything, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to just start by saying welcome to everybody. I'm so glad you're here. Know that we have food over here, and this is a very informal setting, so don't feel like you have to wait till somebody stops talking or anything to go get grab another sandwich or cookie or whatever. And let me tell you something. I'm not planning to take this stuff home, so y'all come on and eat, okay? So I'm just, I'll start with that. I'm from down south, so, you know, that's how we are, right? We, we, we like feeding people. So my name is Michelle Gross, and I am um, one of the founders of Communities United Against Police Brutality, and I'm currently the president. Um, the organization is uh, around a long time now. We're an all-volunteer organization. We have no paid staff, but we're in our 20th year. And I think that's not insignificant, you know. Um, we take on our work in three specific ways. We provide advocacy for people dealing with the effects of police brutality. So um, that means that we have a 24-hour hotline. We line people up with lawyers. We um, help people gather evidence in their cases. We go to court with people. I personally work with a lot of families of people who have been killed by the police to help them with their very specific needs and the kinds of things that, you know, that, that come up for them. And so we do a lot of that kind of stuff. But we always make it clear that we're about social justice, not social services. And so when people want help from us, they actually have to come to our meetings to get it. And that's because what we're trying to do is build a movement here. And so that's, um, you know, a really important and key concept for the work that we do. And so, you know, we, we, uh, we get people involved. Uh, part of the deal is this. If you have experienced police brutality, and I can talk about this because I'm the survivor of a very serious incident of police brutality from New Orleans, where we're both from, by the way. Um, and so, um, you know, it's a very disempowering experience. You lose bodily integrity. You might have legal impacts. You have job and um, housing impacts and things like that. And we can't just go up to people who are dealing with all that and just go, oh, sorry you got beat up, now join the movement. We got to give them some legs under them, but we also have to empower them by getting them involved in the movement. And when you start to fight back, that is when you get your personal power back. And that's a really important and core concept for our group. Um, the second thing that we do a lot of is political activities to try to change the underlying causes of police brutality. Things like um, everything from the protests last, last night to um, doing things with legislation and you know shutting down city council meetings, speaking at city council meetings, whatever it takes to try to change the underlying causes of police brutality. And of course, we're gonna talk about those kinds of things tonight. And particularly, we want you to talk about these things, the things you wanna see happen. And then the third area we work in is in education. We do a ton of Know Your Rights trainings all over the, before COVID, obviously, all over the city any, or the whole area. Anywhere anybody would have us, we were there to do Know Your Rights trainings, teach people about, teach neighborhoods how to do their own cop watch, um, do lots of kinds of things of that nature. And so that was really um, a lot. And what we are doing now is our, some of that same kind of stuff, but virtually. So we have a cop watch, I mean, I'm sorry, a um, Know Your Rights training that's coming up next Friday at five o'clock. We have a Facebook event about it that will tell you how to dial in. It's a teleconference. Um, some of, a lot of our members um, are, you know, that, that are active with us are fairly low income and may not have reliable access to the internet. So while, you know, while we'd love to do things with Zoom and all that, we do things with teleconferencing so people can participate, even if they don't have, you know, internet. So, um, so we do a lot of those kinds of educations and they're valuable because they can keep people, you know, it's all about harm reduction in that case is to try to keep people from getting hurt. And so we do those kinds of things as well. And it's part of like community development. So these are some of the kinds of things we do. Um, we, we are at all, again, I told you before, we're an all volunteer group. We love volunteers because we can't get anything done without them. We're all volunteers. And so um, the, the, we always say that we are only limited in what we do by how many people we have to do it. So if you're interested in getting involved with us, you can go on our website and sign up. You can sign our, um, our clipboard out here tonight. Um, we'd love to have you get involved. And we do um, a ton of different things all the time. So, um, you know, any area of interest you have, whether it's research, writing, protesting, planning events, doesn't matter, you know, working directly with families, working, doing some kind of legalistic type work or whatever the work it is, we have ways for you to, to sign up, plug in and get involved. And so I want to um, invite you to do that as well. Um, 
the normal person that was going to be announcing tonight um, unfortunately had a death in her family so I'm kind of pinch hitting a little bit um, because I was also planning to speak about the group so unfortunately you're gonna hear my voice more than I would like you to and I apologize for that in advance but you know sometimes emergencies do happen I'm also waiting for a representative of uh, Twin Cities Coalition for Justice for Jamar to speak and they're gonna talk about uh, their community um, their CPAC um, which is uh, that has to do with community control of the police and so um, we're going to be talking about kind of those areas, but also getting your ideas about where to from here. You know, Minneapolis has been through a lot. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, man, a lot, right? And one of the things that's happened, and while we had the, why we had the idea for this event, is that in other cities where bad things happen, there's usually a commission to try to figure out what has caused these things to happen and how they can avoid having them happen again. What did we get in Minneapolis? Nothing. You know, what we got was some very um, interesting promises from our city council that they couldn't follow through on. And then they are now talking about a year long conversation. Well, we're four and a half months past the death of George Floyd and I have yet to see that conversation start. The little things they've already done are things where you had to submit your question a day before. They may or may not answer your question. You had no ability to speak at the event. These are not ways to engage the community. These are ways to control the narrative. And that's disgusting to us. So we, well, our plan tonight is just to talk a little bit and then shut up and listen to you. So we've got a microphone right there. We're going to ask you to come and give your testimony. And, you know, we love it to be a little bit about what for the future. But if you have other things you want to say and you're here, we are delighted you're here. Please come forward and tell your story. Talk about what you want to talk about. We are filming, and that's only because we're not going to identify you. We're not going to use you that, you know, use your thing. What we're going to do is we're going to transcribe all the testimonies into a report, not by your name or anything, just um, transcribe those testimonies, look for common themes, and develop a report of recommendations. And so we're really, really, um, you know, wanting you to t come up and feel free and tell your story. This is absolutely essential. We can't go forward as a community unless we talk about what's happened here. We just can't. So I invite you to, to really participate. This isn't an observation, this is a participation. Fair enough? All right, you guys. So with that, um, I don't know, I'm looking for the TCC for J folks. Okay, I think they're still figuring it out, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're talking about, uh, some of the kind of recommendations and things that we've been talking about in Minneapolis. In the immediate aftermath of the killing of George Floyd, um, what we did was we came up with a report of 44 recommendations that were statewide to end police violence. You'll find that report on our website. We have um, the, the two-page version of it. The actual report itself is, is about 25 pages, but you've got the two-page summary of it here on the table. Um, many of these recommendations would require legislative action. And so, you know, the city always likes to say, we can't do anything because, you know, our hands are tied and blah, blah, blah. You know, they always talk about the union and they talk about all the reasons why they can't do a damn thing. But the material reality is that they can do things that they want to do. They can do a lot of things and they could have been doing those things before George Floyd was killed. And they seem to have um, decided that, you know, they can make the state the state the scapegoat, the union the scapegoat, but the reality is they don't have the political will. So we said, okay, you know what, you guys? Clearly you're not too bright. We'll help you out here, city council. We will put the things that Minneapolis can do without any help from the legislature on a document, a separate document. And so we gave them a list of recommendations, two pages worth even, front and back, and gave them recommendations of things that they could do right now, again, without the legislators, uh, legislature's help, and we are still waiting for them to do any of these things. Some of the kinds of things that we think that should happen right now, the Minneapolis, you know, they talked about abolishing the police, dismantling the police, defunding the police, and all this stuff like that. 
They didn't define what that meant. And now most recently, the New York Times came out with an article that where the city council members said, well, we met in spirit. Did you all see that article? We're like, are you kidding me? You meant it in spirit? What the hell does that mean? You know, you're kidding, right? So that's problematic. Our plan that we're recommending has three parts, kind of in the broad sweep. Downsize the Minneapolis police. Efficiency studies that were done about a year and a half, two years ago, um, showed that 60% of patrol officers' time is on what's called self-directed activities. That means they're driving around looking for stuff to do. And what does that mean? What happens when they do that? You guys tell me. The what? Yeah, donut shop, but also what? Let's say on the north side, what happens? Don't they mess with people? They're driving around looking for people to harass. That's the essential deal of it, is they're running around harassing people. So we said to ourselves, hmm, that's how you spend 60% of your time? Maybe we need 60% less of you folks. Um, we certainly think we need at least 50% less. So downsize the cops, but don't just downsize them. There are service needs in the community, but we don't need the cops to be the ones providing that service. There are a ton of things that happen in the community that need a response, but not a law enforcement response, not a response that looks at things through a law enforcement lens. For example, mental health crisis calls. 50% of the people who are killed by police are in the throes of a mental health crisis at the time. This is appalling. So our thing was to downsize the police, but redirect those funds to the appropriate responders, mental health workers, social workers for things like homelessness, medical workers for things like drug overdoses and other you know, chemical dependencies. These kinds of things are not appropriate for police to respond to. So the magic question is why the hell are they responding to them? So let's stop that right now. If people wanna talk about abolishing the police, this is a good way to move in that direction. Get them out of doing the things that they shouldn't be doing. So downsize, redirect the funds, and rein in the ones you have left. Maybe if we have a police department that's half the size it is, they can actually get their asses under control. You know? So might, might, might be easier for them to handle a smaller number of employees. I don't know. They also have to have the political will. But that's one of our main sort of sets of recommendations. We have a work group, the mental health work group, and that work group, um, and I'm on that, I actually I run that work group, and I love that work group because it, it's something I'm very passionate about. We spent a year and a half writing a white paper that's 160 pages long, has over 500 references, that lays out a very specific plan for how to end police-only responses to mental health crisis calls. And we are now talking to city council members and we're saying to them, listen, this is the low-hanging fruit, you guys. This is the easy thing, because it's obvious as hell that cops have no business responding into the, you know, to those type of calls, right? They don't even want to respond to them. So why does this continue? So we are bugging them now. We're about to launch a public campaign, and we hope you'll help us with it, to bug the crap out of those people to actually do this. Because they're all coming up with all little excuses and this and that and why it would be hard. And there's plenty of money for it. It's not even an expensive proposition. But we're going to have to really fight. But it's the way we can start this process of getting police out of our business. So that's like the low-hanging fruit. And then we'll go on to things like stopping them from dealing with homelessness, stopping them from dealing with, you know, other kinds of things like welfare checks and stuff that don't need cops. But these are how we're going to get started. So we're looking for that. We're looking for more robust civilian review. So that part about reining in the cops, that last part, we're only going to be able to do that if we have really good civilian review, civilian oversight of the police. And so I know that um, TCC4J is going to talk about some of that. But I just want to tell you this. What, what, I want to tell you the current situation so you know why, why it's a problem. Current situation looks like this. We have this thing called the Office of Police Conduct Review. It's um, an agency that was supposed to be for 10 community oversight, but it's actually 100% of it is controlled by city staff and police department. It is 100% controlled. Let me tell you the results of what a situation looks like like that. In their seven and a half years of existence, they have received 3,133 complaints from members of the community. This is from their data now. We get their data from them. 
We don't make this up. This is their data. 3,133 complaints from the community. They have disciplined, want to guess how many? Anybody got a guess? 13. 13 in seven and a half years, you guys. 13. That's like less than two a year. The, the discipline rate of that body is 0.42%, less than half of 1%. The national average for civilian oversight bodies is 7 to 8%. So you can really see that we're like the low end outlier, right? How ridiculous this is, how utterly ridiculous. So we don't have any kind of appropriate um, oversight and discipline. I, even with that body, the worst discipline somebody got was 40 hours of suspension. And that was like one guy. Most of them just get a letter of reprimand. So it's like meaningless crap, you know, it doesn't mean anything. You know, when people say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna report you to the police or to the OPC, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a complaint about you. The cops go, yeah, go ahead, man, who cares? Huh, you know, of course, because when you have that kind of outcome, they know nobody's gonna be held accountable. For even serious things that they do, they won't be held accountable. So it's a damn joke. So we've gotta be talking about putting the, the discipline in the hands of the community. Like I said, I know we've got folks here that are gonna talk about that with TCC for j so I don't wanna steal their thunder. And we have lots and lots of other kinds of recommendations. One big one was important negotiations with the police union, the police federation. I don't like to call it a union because it actually represents management and line staff, which makes it a federation. So it's not really a real union. But we made, we worked with several organizations, a coalition of us, made 14 recommendations that would greatly improve the police federation contract and we went and we talked to the city councils and we said you got to do this stuff you got to take this up this was like a year and a half ago they had plenty of time long before george floyd was killed and they have done everything they can to keep the community from knowing anything about these negotiations and they've been holding us back and trying to keep us from pushing forward on these recommendations and it's ridiculous things like getting rid of a lot of the overtime um, steroid required mandatory steroid testing after a critical incident, um, more frequent mental health evaluations, all kinds of different things that would actually get at the culture of policing to address it. And they are doing everything they can to keep these things from happening. So this is your city council that keeps talking and blathering about dismantling and abolishing and defunding and blah, 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 and they're not doing it. And by the way, just a little quick side note, and then I'm going to shut up and bring up the TCC for J folk. Um, you know, you're, like I said, your city council, mine too, because I live in North Minneapolis area, um, they came up with a nice little thing about, oh, we're going to, you know, we got to defund and all that. You know, they all stood in the park and they sounded nice and all of this stuff, you know, and it all sounded good on paper. That night I remember that I wrote on Facebook, this is happy talk. And I know people got mad at me for writing that. People were like, don't tell us that truth. We don't want to know that truth. People got mad at me for that, but I've seen these clowns for way too long. I know how they operate. They finally get a chance to defund the cops because a couple months ago, the city's budget was tanking. And it was tanking because, you know, we don't have revenues coming in from the convention center or from the parking ramps and all this stuff. So our revenues are short because of COVID and they have extra expenses because of COVID. So, this, the budget's tanking. They have to cut the budget, that's fine. They did an across the board 15% cut for every single department in the city and they did a hiring freeze. Understandable, except the Minneapolis Police Department. Now this was a golden opportunity for the city council to cut the cops, right? What'd they do for the cops? They cut them by 0.75%, less than 1%. And they did not put, them a, a, put a hiring freeze on them. So that's your city council that's talking about defund, de this, de that, whatever. You know, DDD, -de -de, right? DDD -de -de nothing. So I just want you all to know how unserious your city council members are about this whole thing. And with that, I want to bring up our folks, our fine folks with TCC for J. We um, consider them great coalition partners that we work with a lot of things together and they are um, doing terrific work around community um, engagement and community um, control of the police. So I'm eager for them to talk about their program. And then after that, we're gonna shut up and let you guys talk, okay? Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool, because I don't wanna take off my mask, sorry. 
Um, my name is Loretta Van Pelt. I'm with uh, Twin Cities Coalition for Justice for Jamar, and I've been with the group since uh, day one of our coalition starting. Um, we um, we formed after Jamar Clark was uh, killed, um, not too far from here, actually, and. Um, we uh, it was a little bit bigger than it is now, but it was but it was um, a lot of it was the response to what happened to when Jamar Clark was killed. Um, one of uh, the victories, or one of the things we did was we demanded and we we demanded that there be no grand jury in his case. Um, what ended up happening was we heard Mike Freeman's lives on live TV, versus. Um, versus it being in secret. So that was the, you know, we, we got the win of no grand jury, but we got to see, and we've seen it played out. We see it play, we see it play out over and over. We saw it in Breonna Taylor's case as well. The lies, the, the grand, well, actually it was the AG that lied because one of the grand jurors is wanting the, wanting the transcript out. But um, anyway, um, so we've been for five years just out there working, uh, um, working with fam working not only against uh, police violence, but also working with the families, working with families who have been um, impacted, like like Michelle, not to the extent CUAPB, but you know, peop um, we've had people reach out to us with helping with, um, you know, protests or just some kind of support, whether it was some kind of organizational support. Um, and so um, we thought that we would have a lot more time with our organizing when COVID happened, uh, especially around community control. And then George Floyd was murdered. And so that kind of elevated our work, not only with, work, uh, with all the actions that happened this summer. Uh, we didn't plan every action, but we were a part of a lot of actions. And then also uh, with the community control piece uh, with our legislation, we realized we had to um, hurry up with it because there was a talk of abolishing and defunding. And we were like, well, we, we all had the idea that it wouldn't work because of, because it, I mean, that New York Times article said it all, like the minute they said, the minute it came out of their mouths, they, did, they, they regretted saying it. And so um, we, we, a lot of us in our group knew, yeah, that it's not gonna happen. And so um, what we are proposing is a, um, a all civilian um, um, council, accountability council that would, um, that would uh, ensure, what, I don't know, I don't wanna say ensure, but that would actually have some teeth now, unlike the OP was OPCR that doesn't have teeth, this uh, this would not have cops on it. It would not have family members of cops on it, um, and also it would uh, it would be elected. So that means the people would choose who's on that council versus versus the mayor appointing their friend or some or or the a city council person appoint uh, giving their friend a favor. It would actually be an all elected civilian council um, a, a lot of it um, what we what we are proposing with it too is things like we control the that that council controls the budget that that committee controls the um, hiring and firing that we actually that you actually that we actually wouldn't be like oh yeah we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have you be on administrative pay while we investigate you killing this person no you're fired basically is part of it i might be like kind of simplifying it a bit but but that's what that's what we are meaning by community control that it's not it's not appointed it's it's elected that it would be people in this city electing the people on that council and also holding them accountable too like that they would be held accountable just like the city council should be held accountable just like the mayor should be held accountable just like just like just like any other elected official that that group would also be held accountable so if they don't do their job we can vote them out so um i don't know jay if you wanted to add um yeah my name is jay yates um, i'm also with tcc for jay 
Um, I, I've been working with Loretta and some other people going through um, the, the legislation that we've been working on um, and sort of adding in some of the suggestions that other groups like CUAPB um, have made on that legislation. Um, but I think for me, one of the things that I was honestly confused about when I first heard of community co control police was I thought of community policing. Um, and this is not that. And I think it's really important to be clear about what CPAC is not. Um, it's not any of this like officer friendly stuff. We're not, we're not interested in, in, in working like with the police to like foster community bonds or whatever. Like that's 100% not what community control does. It's more um, replacing the control that the police have over themselves to police their own behavior and replacing it with people that actually have a vested interest in holding them accountable for that behavior um, when that behavior uh, endangers the lives of people in the community. Um, so I think one of the, I don't know why that keeps happening. Closer? Okay. <laughs> I thought it was like I needed to go further away and I was like, no one's going to be able to hear me. Um, sorry, I don't know how mics work. Um, yeah, so I think one of the other um, things that's really important about um, our CPAC legislation in particular is um, having all of the all of the districts of the city um, really well represented that we want to figure out some way to make sure that um, people who are on the council actually like live in the city um, and actually have at least some connection to the city. Um, I know that we've also discussed a lot in our um, our meetings that it's not necessarily fair or practical to be like, you know, you have to live in like the city proper to run for city council because people have been getting pushed out of the city um, monetarily for, you know, ever. So people can't necessarily afford to actually live in Minneapolis proper, but we do want people to at least not live like in Hugo, you know, like, um, <laughs> We don't think that that makes any sense for people who don't even live here to be making decisions about um, that are really life or death decisions. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't think I have anything else to like present. I think that I I think we should open up for questions. Okay, so to get started really quick, uh, we heard from Jay, Loretta, and Michelle uh, about CPAC and and what it means and and. Uh, communities um, kind of uh, creating their own their own uh, security throughout their neighborhood and uh, everybody here d just chime in whenever you know uh, you know a, a question goes up and you feel like answering really quick just just to get um, just so this mic is here for you and I'll, I'll wipe it down with a sandy wipe but real quick Raise your hand and shout it out. When I say the word accountability, like what's the first word that comes to your mind? Just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Accountability. When I say accountability, yeah. Trust. What else? Justice. Transparency. What? <laughs> say a lot of. Reliable. Reliable. Okay. Yes. Cons Ooh, consequences. Okay. What? Boundaries, boundaries, constant. You can even turn me down. You don't need to have me up this loud. I talk loud as it is. Uh, reliable consequences, boundaries, justice. We had a few other words. So when we talk about that, and just to to point out the obvious, the obvious things that have occurred lately, you've seen uh, you've seen Derek Chauvin walk. You've seen John Ripple walk, who's responsible for the murder of Calvin Horton. Uh, you've seen Montez Lee behind bars for four months, Mayan Burrell behind bars for over 15 years. So it seems like there is a disparity in accountability and almost as if, you know, citizens are supposed to understand the law more than the cops are. What, what is accountability, and, and, and Jay or Loretta chime in at, at any point here, what does accountability sound like amongst the community. Let's, let's just remove, remove police from it really quick. What does a community look like that has their own accountability? I'm gonna put this here 
get a Sandy White, but like, I, it would be preferred to have at least three or four people lined up. And it's not like you're answering to them like they're the, you know, the tribunal. But, but we could, we could, I know it's, the setup is weird. It's like the Twin Cities Coalition, Justin for tomorrow. I come to you with this plea. Um, but, but what, like, like tell us, what does accountability amongst the community look or sound like? And I know some of y'all saw it during the first weekend after the murder of George Floyd. What does accountability look like amongst the community? What does that look like? Come on, line up. I want to, we want to hear from y'all. This is the last one. We got to hear from y'all. Go ahead. How y'all doing? <clears throat> I'm Cortez Rice. Uh, accountability for the community will be uh, equality, sticking together. You know, uh, as far as one another, brothers and sisters, uh, that's, what, that's what it'll be for accountability for the community, okay. I would think. Mm -hmm. Cool. Right. Thank you. Thank you. What else? What else? What does accountability look like or sound like amongst the community? Come on. We know y'all have some ideas. Line it up. Three or four people. We're going to wait you out. We got a gentleman coming right We're going to wait you out. I'll be like a teacher and start cold calling people. <laughs> <laughs> Come on up, sir. Flashbacks to middle school. <laughs> Come on up, sir. Come on up. Come on. Don't be Minnesota. Just get in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I think to me, accountability looks like transparency. I think uh, too often we see status quo get in the way of people mm -hmm. truly connecting and truly understanding wherein a problem lies. Uh, and I think all too often, especially when police and politicians are concerned, this idea of maintaining status quo because of, I don't know, class or as we've seen again and again, race often takes precedence. So to me, True accountability within a community is where everyone can come to a space, they can talk about their problems, and they can all discuss them as equals. Would that mean, just, just to not let you off the hook really quick, would that mean like neighbors getting to know neighbors and not just like, I don't know that person across the street, their business is their business? Like, What, what does the transparency mean amongst neighbors? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really interesting because uh, for me personally, I got to know my neighbors during the uprisings better than I did in years of living together. Mm. And I think it took a situation that was almost life or death in a sense. I mean, there was unmarks driving around my neighborhood. I got chased and stuff. The only people I could count on were the people that I could talk to and that I could see. You know what I mean? And so, at least in my mind, that transparency, a huge part of it is knowing your neighbors, knowing, you know, these communities and organizations that exist around you that can help you, that can give you a voice like everybody we see here tonight. Okay. And before the next person gets up on the mic, you can put that down. The, the, um, I want to turn it to Loretta and Jay. Uh, is, is that kind of the spirit of what you're speaking to in, in communities? Uh, in CPAC, can you tell me the acronym, what it means again? Um, it's Civilian Police Accountability Council. This, is transparency kind of in the spirit of what you were mentioning, or is, it, is there something further than that? Um, I think that, sorry. Um, I think transparency and, like, Loretta, obviously, um, say whatever you want after, but... Um, I think that like transparency is obviously a huge part, but I think that it does go a little bit further than that of like, we actually want people to get justice after they are harmed by the police. So it's not, it's not just enough to be kind of like transparent about whatever horrifying things the police are doing, but to actually like, they actually have to face consequences for doing that. Um, and they have to face, they have to actually face the community as part of that. Um, and with the civilian council, um, one of the things that's, you know, being written into the legislation um, that we have is that um, there have to be like a certain number of like meetings every year for like people, like regular people to come and like talk to the council mm -hmm. so that they know what the process is and so that they know um, what they can do like outside of those meetings if that makes sense to like share out like how can the community help itself even when like the council's not officially meeting mm. or like even when um nobody's getting you know murdered by the cops but maybe you have cops like in your neighborhood that are um making you feel unsafe like they're casing up your house um they don't have a warrant like that sort of stuff of just like not just not just having it be transparent but also like 
making sure that something actually comes of these grievances. And, and cops don't need to murder people in the neighborhood for them to traumatize exactly. people, correct? Exactly. Okay. The next person, you want to come up here? Yep. Um, hi, my name is Nell. All right. Um, I guess I would say uh, in the community, accountability looks like interconnectivity and longevity. So that means um, showing up past the performative allyship, you know, whenever someone dies, showing up for a month to mm -hmm. protest and then dipping out. Um, we need you to join oh, organizations. We need you to organize. We need you to open your wallet and donate to organizations that are, are, are advocating for these rights. Um, we need you to donate to mutual aid because we have people that are homeless in the encampments and the government is doing nothing about it. So they're going to they're gonna freeze this winter unless we step up and, and take care of each one another. So being interconnected and having the longevity to stick with it um, and realize that progress, it takes time. And although we should not have to wait this long already, um, we have to be persistent and we have to be consistent with our community. Um, so definitely just connect with one another and take care of one another. Don't be out here to look for yourself. Be out here and, and make your decisions. Um, make sure your decisions are for everyone. And when you're practicing being an ally, make sure it's not just you know, outside at protests, but when you go home and you're around your black friends um, and uh, something happens with the police or something happens that is maybe a microaggression or whatever, be open to change, be open to feedback. Um, so those are things that I, I think shows accountability is consistency and continuing to show up and prolong that relationship within your community. I really quick wanted to touch on a point that you made with performative allyship. Racially, what are the connotations of that? And then two, what, what is an example of performative allyship that you experienced over the past few months? Sure. Um, I guess I would say like seeing those blanket statements from, you know, local organizations and companies within Minneapolis saying that they stand with black, you know, Black Lives Matter. And they are, th are these are these predominantly white companies or are these black yep. companies? Yeah. White com yes. Yep. Just standing, saying that they're, you know, they understand that this is happening and they stand with the movement. Mm -hmm. But there is there was no action. There is no money donated. Um, there was no time donated. And once that month passed, and, and once everyone stopped sharing their black screens on Instagram, there was nothing else. That they it, it almost seemed like the black screen was like a, a marker for performative allyship. Like those who put it up, it was like, oh, they're going to be gone in about a week. Yeah. Um, what, 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 what? Uh, so that be an example. What is the danger of performative allyship amongst the white community uh, down the road, and how do you want that to change? Um, the danger is that, you know, you're kind of feeling like you're making a change, but it's very shallow. Nothing's happening in, on the inside. You're not changing on the inside to really understand what is happening to other people of color and other black people that are dealing with these issues in the, in the community. So if you're only performative, you're not truly out here for us. You're out here for you so you can feel better about yourself. And we're still going to get murdered and we're still not going to have rights and we're still going to be where we are right now. So... I'm right here, sir. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Come on. Do you want to speak to what you just said? Or? Um, I really appreciate what you just said, and I just want to say that because I think about you were you mentioned that, um, um, Wells Fargo. <laughs> you know, Wells Fargo can put a nice thing on their screen or this and that and the other crap, but they're still part of the redlining. Mm -hmm that keeps people of color from being able to move in certain neighborhoods and things like that. They're also discrimination, discriminatory in their loan practices and all kinds of things. So it's like, you know, don't you dare put that crap up on your screen and then you keep on being the way you are. I just want to throw that out. They cheat people. Yeah, they cheat people too. You ain't never lying. Take their homes away. All kind of dirty stuff. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is JP and I want to, um, I first was going to say something about how accountability in a community takes honesty because we have a bunch of leaders that um, they, they have a lying problem. They say one thing and they do another thing and they're not being real even with themselves. Like, I even think that some of these leaders think that they think that Black Lives Matter and they do not. Like, it's just performative. Um, and then uh, when the person before me just 
was talking about businesses. I wanted to say something about that because it makes me so, like I am shaking right now, I'm so mad because there are all these white businesses out here with Black Lives Matter on their windows and on their websites and they're doing that because it's their, the bottom, it's the bottom line. They're afraid that the community is gonna come after them. Uh, they want the money and that is just a direct line of a long line of white people making money off black people's pain and it is disgusting and i can't stand it and it has to stop so so real quick dp uh, because you mentioned this and we kind of got into it segued into it we talk about accountability amongst the police we we kind of understand what that is and what it is and we talk about accountability amongst the community and talking about cpac and now we're getting into this discussion about race being involved what do you think needs to be like like we talk about allyship or or being an accomplice what would you what would you what do you think is the necessary step for the white community to create this accountability amongst community going forward what what, what do what does the white community have to do in minnesota let alone minneapolis um, I am not qualified to speak on that in any way. Well, what would you like to see them do? I would like to see every single white person in this community take a class with Catrice M. Jackson and learn about how they show up with their white violence. And um, just like that's part of the getting honest about it. That's part of the learning where it's coming from because it is so deep seated in our whiteness that we often can't see it. And it takes people who experience racism it takes people like Catrice Jackson who can deal with teach white people which is amazing um to show us so I think every white person needs to shut up and listen to Catrice <laughs> and it's good to, thank you thank you and it's good to point out that Catrice uh is, is is holds workshops on dismantling whiteness um and, and works with other uh black leaders in the city I want to turn it to Loretta and Jay when we talk about race amongst like community accountability, and I understand that some of these communities coming together during the riots and whatnot, it was everybody coming together at George Floyd Square. White people are more than you know welcome to the meetings. What is where does race? How does race play in the CPAC? And how do you hold discussions about that going forward for that kind of activity? I think with TCC for J. Can y'all hear me? Okay. All right, with TCC for J, I think we try to be intentional that it, it the, there are white people in our group, yeah, but we make it intentional that it's black led, it's left led, it's led by working class people, it, or you know, I mean, so, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's all it's yeah, it we're intentional about that because we know that that this this is rooted in our liberation really it's rooted in in black liberation and so what we so we're intentional about that you know we, we welcome everyone to our meetings we welcome you know if you're if you're about uh, you're about uh holding police accountable you're about um you're about the liberation of black people and people of color in general you're welcomed in TCC for J. We, you know, but you know, just know, just know, if you're white, you, we gonna just put you to work. So, <laughs> um, like, grunt work. But you know, I'm I'm being honest. So, but yeah, but it's but it's we try to be intentional with it, and I think um, a lot of people tend to think because they see certain people in our group and they think it's white led. It, it is not. Those they just happen to be the ones that show up a lot. <laughs> I would also say that if you think that TCC for J is white led, like you probably just don't come to any of our actual events. <laughs> like you're like I I came on a TCC for J back when we were organizing the Pride protest. Um and I specifically chose to join up with TCC for J one because they put out a call for like black trans people to help with the planning for Pride because they recognized that that's not something that necessarily gets um highlighted during during pride month and so i was like well that's me so i'll go and see like what i can help do um and i also chose tcc for j because i had actually heard of them before like i think that a lot of these other groups are really just sort of popping up out of nowhere and that's fine 
but I think that also the work really speaks for itself. Um, and I think that TCC for J's um, intentionality about making sure that, you know, black voices are always heard in our meetings because like most of the people in the meetings, like a good half is, is black people. Um, and so I, I think that the politics of race absolutely play into to our organization and also with what Toussaint was originally asking with CPAC, I think that we're very cognizant of what we don't want to happen, which is having just a bunch of white people run for these offices. Um, I mean, like half of the people on city council and in other government um, positions don't even actually live here. Like they have like a condo here that they come to when like, you know, stuff is in session and then they like go back to like whatever rich people suburb they lived in before. So like, that's just something that we are trying really hard to like write into our legislation to avoid that happening um, because that's already happening. We don't want more of that. Okay, thank you. Really quick, we're gonna get 10 people. We're gonna take no, no less than 10 people because the first person that spoke up, we're gonna get into, what? Oh, there's another person. Oh my goodness, the lights are shining. I can't see anything. Get up here, get up here. From the darkness, okay, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Um, hi, can you all hear me? Yep. Uh, my name is Kara. Public speaking makes me really nervous. Um, I appreciate what um, that someone brought up consistency. Thank you. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, yeah, consistency, and um, I was also going to bring up um, follow through for um, accountability. I think it's important to follow through in a meaningful way. Um, and what I've experienced in this city, um, I grew up in South, and uh, what I've experienced is just kind of a lot of people, especially people with privilege, which is also a lot of white people, um, just kind of taking those pretty words and assuming that everything is fine after that. Um, and this goes for a lot of things, in my opinion, not just police accountability, but other stuff as well. Um, so yeah, like meaningful follow through and actually following up is city council actually defunding the police or are they just saying pretty words? Do you feel that they're following through? Um, no, I don't, not at all. Okay, okay, good, <laughs> good to know. Yeah. <laughs> all right, um, Thank you. what would follow through look like to you, just real quick before you leave? Um, for, for police accountability in particular and um, racial justice, I mean, like engaging with the community more. Um, the government, I think, asks us a lot to come to them for public comment and stuff, but they never really come into the community. Um, and when they do, it's mostly just them talking. Um, so I think actually like engaging with people um, on a more base level, and then, uh, I don't know, like putting their money where their mouth is and actually yeah. doing the thing. Okay, yeah. thank, you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna take no less than 10 people. This is a real quick, this is just, this is super quick. The first person that came up said, that it brought their community together when it was kind of a life or death situation. It felt like it. We want 10 people to come up and just say, when was the first time you felt community amongst your neighborhood? When was it and, and what happened? Just real quick. 10 folks, come on up. We just want to hear, when did you feel community amongst your neighborhood and what happened? Or has everybody here never felt community amongst their neighborhood? Real quick, real quick. Come on, come on. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you organizers. They've been out here all day, every day. Um, community, uh, for me, I actually grew up what we called the low ends, just uh, right off Penn there, uh, lower north side. Community to me, uh, it started as, I guess, kind of I guess you could say I was a minority I was one of the few white guys living on my block but out of the love I was shown by my uh, people of color friends uh, I've been showing nothing but love and if you look at maybe somewhere like west uptown you don't get that same kind of love when it goes the other way um so to me i guess community is 
something like Floyd Town. If you've ever been there, you feel the community. It's not just, oh, you show up and drop a couple flowers and walk around. It's like, no, you talk to people and they treat you like family. Like, even just a couple blocks where I grew up, they treat you like family. So you mentioned the low ends, you mentioned Floyd Town. Real quick to follow up with what you said, what do you want the future of your community in regards to police accountability to look like going forward? You say Floyd Town is a great example, and you can pretty much do it anywhere. It would be pretty, pretty dangerous, and you, nev you need everybody to come together. What do you want going forward in the future for community? Uh, I guess, A, there needs to just be that more... You need to have those conversations if people are uncomfortable around another gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation. That needs to be that uncomfortable conversation you just need to have. Yeah. Because that exposure just needs to happen. We are attempting to make the change, but in t until like family members speak to family members, give that exposure, people are just pretty unaware. So awareness needs to be raised. Uh, just that exposure needs to happen. Okay. I mean, I know that last, uh, what was it, two forums ago, we were out in the Uptown, and it was just mainly, like, a ton of white people just saying, oh, well, yeah, like, Uptown's all right but it's not all right it's mainly just you know it's a very predominantly white run like there's a division there between like almost the west and the east side as far as the city goes and towards like lake street and beyond yeah um and you want people to talk amongst each other like at dinner tables about their own community to create community. I guess that would be one suggestion. I mean, okay, there's plenty, but yeah, there are, there are. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah. Hello, I'm Melissa, and um, I grew up in Missouri in like this little tiny podunk white town, and then I now I live in the north side. I've lived here for the last twelve years, and. <laughs> Um, and anyway, so when I moved here, though, I feel like that's when I started kind of seeing what community actually looks like, because I think in my town growing up, I didn't actually know really any of my neighbors. And so when you were talking earlier about like, what does it look like? What does the white community need to do? I think we white people are so comfortable with being very individualistic and not being community oriented. So I think it just like becomes a matter of getting out of our comfort zones to actually start to know our neighbors. And so living here, I feel like that's kind of changed me because I actually know people that live on either side of me and they have they've looked out for me you know I, I'm uh, single I live there by myself and so sometimes there have been times where um, maybe something is happening on the block or whatever and so my one neighbor will come over and check on me or something and like he's mowed my lawn before just because I've let it go too long or whatever and so there's like this very mutual like I'll we'll, we'll take care of one another I think and so I think and even just in the small ways you know but then there's an, a white couple that just moved on to the block just this last summer or no this last year and it was right after George Floyd was killed that they put up an American flag and they put up a um, don't tread on me flag too so it was, yeah thank wow. you in North Minneapolis and it was so then the rest of the neighbors and I, we've all been kind of like looking out for one another because of that. So we've been able to actually have conversations like, are you watching these guys? Okay, like, let's look out for one another. And I think that's something that's really beautiful because I just didn't have that before. So I think that's, and I, to me, so when people were talking about, you know, like defunding the police or just funding community things and that kind of thing too, like, or just the community oversight of the police, I think one thing that's really powerful about that is seeing how that's already happened in the community like seeing how that like people on my block we don't call the police if there's an emergency we're looking unless we're looking out for each other first off you know so i think that's what i really want to see happen so what do you want to change going forward you say you're looking out for one another you're not calling the police yeah what would, would, would there be like a community coalition like like just like community meetings like every day at george floyd square there is a community meeting at 8 a.m and 7 p.m every day no matter what it happens it, it, would it be something like that or what do you want for your future in your community in regards to policing as well what do you want i 
Well, I kind of feel like it takes, we, I think, I think as a community, we have to actually take more, have more commitment to it ourselves. Like if we want to see change, we have to actually, we, I mean, as cliche as that sounds, but we have to be the change. So we have to like be committed to showing up to things like this or sh being committed to, to if, if like you were talking about the one person was talking about the finally knowing their neighbors after, you know, the uprising began. Well, then if, if we could have like ma somehow maintain that, like have start to have more kind of interconnections and like, yes, like mm -hmm. maybe have uh, weekly meetings or whatever, C but in just becoming creative, like getting together and I don't know, having an app or something that we can report things to one another or something like, you know, how I'm like in some communities, they have like a 411 app. You can like, there's a pothole on this street. Well, maybe there's like a way that you can be like another police officer just went through this there stop. Is. is there an app? Okay. There well there we well there we go. See, just all the things we learn. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Um. Anybody else that's had? Well, like we need eight more. We only had two. Uh. When was the first time you felt community amongst your neighborhood? Like it could have been before George Floyd as well. Yeah. I think I saw it. Um. I went down. Uh. When the down to the third precinct. The night. The night it burned and but before that well i saw a community when it burned but before that um there was it it seemed kind of surreal because there were pockets of stuff going on like in the parking lot by target there was a car burning and everybody was dancing around this car burning uh the medic tent was up and people were don't were giving donations to the medic tent some people were going into the cub to get stuff for the medic tent for free um uh you know and um you know and it was like you know it to me like in that it seemed chaotic but it at the same time it it seemed organized you know there's the medic tent there was there was in the middle of yeah there was food so like in the middle of minnehaha and lake was like pallets of soda just pallets of like coca-cola like i took a couple because i was like that oh it's just, just coca-cola sitting here it was and it was it to me that was you know i mean amidst all the that chaos there was there was some, there was a sense of community and even even as the as the um precinct was burning you know there were people saying uh, like you know I was telling people, don't get people's faces because people were taking pictures. And I was like, make sure you don't get faces. And if you post it, don't get faces and stuff like that. And just, you know, and then um, I remember I was at the back of the precinct and my concern was for there was a lot of young people going in. And my concern was there were still cops in there. And so and so you could you could feel that you could feel some people were like I wanted to as the mom and me wanted to lunge for it and get everybody out. But I was like, wait, no, let it happen. But, but yeah, but I, I felt like the, that first day there, and then, and then throughout the weeks throughout, like every action, you see the medics had, you didn't have a mask, you got a mask. You didn't, everybody was handing out water. People were looking out for children. You know, every time a child went, got separated from a parent, things would stop and we would try to find that, that, that child to the parent and all that stuff. And. I thank people for looking out for my children when we were at Actions too. So, it you know it, I feel like that I feel like we still have it. I mean th our our actions are getting smaller because the weather and that, but I still feel like we still have that community. I still see the same people I saw in June that I'm seeing now. So that's where I'm seeing community. And what do you want for your community going forward? I mean, you talk about CPAC. Like, what what do you want for the future of your community, Loretta? Sorry, Michelle, I hate, I hate to. That's I never happened before during these forums. <laughs> um, I, I don't know, I think what I want going forward is I want, I want to see that, st that same sense of looking out for one another. I think we've all, we've all, I think everybody who spoke has said that, that they were looking out for one another, that same sense of, you know, if I need something, I'm noticing that I'm on a couple of those mutual aid uh, Facebook pages and it seems like someone has a need it, it it gets taken care it may not get taken care of like right away but it gets taken care of someone is on there like i have a resource for this or put up your paypal and we'll make sure you get some money so you can get this i mean i put up a paypal i paycheck i'm a teacher my paycheck went just like that 
and I needed grocery money. I put my pay my PayPal in there, and I think within an hour I had some money. I was like, thank you. So, but I think I mean it's it's more than monetary. It's more than the, it's it's that to to just that looking out for one another. I think we still I think we've done it more now and i think even during covid it was a lot of looking out for one another even though we were apart it was still looking out like hey who has like here's where you can go get food or who has food or here's where you can go get this or here's where you can go get tested and all this stuff so i think i still want to see that going forward is the looking out for one another i actually wanted to give an example of something that i saw 20 years ago um, and what that was, um, we, one of our early cases in Communities United Against Police Brutality, you know, we have this hotline and people call with cases. And one of the early cases was a Latino woman in Richfield who was badly brutalized in her house. The incident um, involved a birthday party for a four-year-old child. And the neighbors called the cops and the cops came and this woman was like, you know, very pregnant, like, you know, right at nine months pregnant, you know, and the cops actually came and they were so brutal to this family that they actually smashed her head through a window and she like got severely, you know, cut up and everything. And then she ended up at Southdale Hospital and ended up getting birth that night. And the nurses were so appalled. They like took pictures of her injuries and all this stuff. And then the cops put all these fake charges on her and she was going to court. Well, we mounted a whole campaign to go to court with her and every time we kept showing up at the court and we had all these uh, flyers going all over the neighborhood and all this stuff and we're going to court and all this stuff they eventually they dropped the charges on her and i won't forget that the prosecutor was like literally he had a handful of our flyers like this group is you know we're not you know we, we didn't bring phony charges uh, uh, you know and uh, but we're dropping the charges i mean it was like great right in court that was a good victory but what i saw in the community that was so amazing to me what had happened is that there was this one family that was always calling the police on people of color in that neighborhood all these people had moved out because of it there was ongoing harassment and the richfield police were more than happy to help that family do it so what this family did was we went around and we talked to all the neighbors except that family that was causing all the problems and we basically had kind of a block party where everybody brought out the food of their culture so everybody got to know each other. Everybody made pledges to back each other up against the onslaught from this family. And eventually that family moved out. And that was a big, you know, real good victory. Yeah, they made, they, they got run out of the neighborhood and that was fabulous. And the families, you know, the, the other families got some peace finally. Um, the other thing that I, that I see happening sometimes, and I really like this, is we help a lot of neighborhoods start their own cop watch. And I love that. I mean, I hope that we get to the point where we don't need cop watch, but when cops are in the neighborhood, it's important to videotape their conduct, to document their conduct, you know, and it's important to do it in a way that the film footage could be used in court if necessary. So we teach people how to do cop watch. And then they've been like, we've, there's several organizations or several um, communities, neighborhoods around the city where they actually set up their own um, schedules and their own, um, you know, kind of cop watch programs in those neighborhoods we teach them how to do it and then we just get away you know we can't be everywhere we're all volunteers but they can handle it in their own neighborhoods and it's a beautiful thing to see this i love this and i think this is a practice i want to see happen more of okay for the folks off to to, to stage right we, we want to reach out to you because we haven't heard from you when was your first time you experienced community just come on up bring it on in bring it on in there's people over here. Again, I, the, I, the lights, I can't. Is there people sl slid over here? Come on in. Who's ever going to come talk? Come through. Come through. Yeah, yeah. Y'all can come on over too. Come through. Um, so I grew up way north um, in a very white uh, neighborhood. But over the last three years, I've been around uh, Powderhorn. And it's been quite a life-changing experience, I have to say. Um, when George Floyd was murdered and the uprising came down, you would go down Lake Street, sorry, when everything was burning and you would see food drives every two blocks to make sure anybody in that area that didn't have access to a grocery store since Target and Cub went up in a few other places, that they made sure that everybody had food. There was money donations, and then as well when the homeless were in Powderhorn, a lot of those people in that 
community were making sure and going out there all the time and making sure that people had things they need, whether it was charging phones, donating some clothes and everything like that. So that was just a, another side that I hadn't seen before in community. And it was pretty cool to walk down Lake Street for a whole probably two weeks and there'd be people either sweeping or donating food. Um, it was awesome to be a part of. So. So you see all of that. You see the food drives. You see the cleaning. You see folks coming out and, and interacting, even though there's a global pandemic. What do you want for your, your community going forward uh, in, in that regard? To see the community engagement that we had those few weeks afterwards continue. Um, it has not been the same. So just making sure people are still out there. If people need help, they need help. If there's anywhere to reach out, reach out, volunteer, do anything like that. Um, it'd be cool to see walking down the streets again and just see people out checking on people and maybe making sure everybody's okay again. Okay. So. Thank you. Thank you. Is anybody else over here that wanted to speak to that when they first felt community or people over here? You want to go? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the mic, my mic's right there. Yeah. So again, I'm Cortez Rice, uh, George Floyd nephew. Uh, blood don't make you family, loyalty does. Um, <clears throat> What I would like to do for the community <clears throat> as far as change, I will, I'm actually in the works of this right now, and I'm speaking this into existence. God is so good. I'm going to be building a Youth for Change Center in Minneapolis, South Minneapolis. This is how we're going to uh, begin equality with, with, uh, with one another as far as black, white, uh, Asian, whatever race you are, and starting it young, uh, teaching each other history. Um, black teaching white uh, history, white teaching black history, but learning each other's history, but most importantly, learning black, about black uh, history. So we will have a black, uh, all black library in there <clears throat> to give back to our, to our community. Um, like I said, this is for as far as uh, equality and uh, uprising our, our youth. Um, this is how we're gonna create the change. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, appreciate that. Yeah, that's huge. Hello, my name is Evan. I grew up in Roseville, and I currently live in St. Paul. But oh, sure. So my name is Evan. I grew up in Roseville in a comfortable suburban childhood, and I currently live in St. Paul. Before this summer, the only time I've ever felt community was not in the U.S. So I've never felt community in the U.S. I moved to Morocco, where people are much more nosy, um, but the point that i was thinking about coming up here is that they're nosy but genuine like really pushy really forward but very genuine and i don't think white minnesotans as a whole i don't think we have been trained to be genuine and so i guess all i want to say is politeness is not kindness nor is it genuine have you ever heard somebody from minnesota ask how your day is and then just kind of not care about what the answer is yeah every day i mean yeah. I'm, gu I'm guilty of that too but yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. So i'm sure michelle can agree with me on this when people in new orleans ask how is your day they will wait until you answer them and when you answer them <laughs> they may have two different follow-up questions okay. like they are actually actively listening so would you so no see in a good way would you yeah. say active listening could be something you want for your community in the future yeah active listening and i would even put up with like grandma's watching every move as well which was kind of the neighborhood i i couldn't bring any friends over without the entire community knowing because the grandmas were like questioning everyone who entered our alley so i would put up with that as long as there is a sense that people are really invested in their neighbor's well-being and you can trust them they're honest okay thank you thank you uh we need we need at least four or three more people depending on if we counted michelle gross or not so, <laughs> uh, yeah, come on up. And we'll lower the mic for you, too. Okay, so I'm not really good at public speaking, but hi, I'm Claire. Um, I wrote down some notes on my phone so I don't forget. Um, so, 
the first time I ever saw and felt what community looked like as an adult specifically was probably at the beginning of the uprising, probably like a lot of you. Um, I was really noticing that all of my friends were really starting to apply what they were good at in order to like see longevity in the movement for not only people my age, but also people who were older than me and younger than me. Um, I saw a lot of people in like Gen Z kind of coming up and like getting excited and like really being a part of their community. Um, I had friends printing shirts and um, donating tens of thousands of dollars just to black nonprofits in the city. Um, I had friends reaching out to me, uh, asking to attending protests, uh, asking to attend protests with me and checking in with my mental health and me with them. And I think that's just one really important thing. Like, it's so important to encourage your friends to come out to these things. Like, really, like, start to normalize getting people out here with you. And you can make it something that feels inclusive and fun with your friends. Um, and it, I mean, obviously it's very serious work, but I think it's just important to really do a lot of outreach with the people that you know and the people that you really love and want to see show up and do better for themselves and for the community. Um, seeing everybody, of course, like cleaning up Lake Street was also a huge thing. That's probably a huge uh, memory for me in, in, in this summer and, and what community looked like for me. Um, and it's the other question. Yeah, but I was going to specific. Yeah, what's the future? What, what is the future that you want for your community? And specifically speaking to you, you said some of your friends were checking in on you, like saying, "Hey, Claire, how are you doing?" Yeah. Like, when some, you know, you kind of call that a wellness check in a sense. But like, would you see there being like community wellness checks instead of, "Oh my goodness, somebody's having, you know, a panic thing. Let me call nine one one." Where yeah, this person so. may die at that point because you know the cops will shoot him. But what would what does that future of your community look like? And specifically, what would a wellness check look like within that community look like? So for me, I am a psychology student. I'm sure I'm not the only one here who has taken a psychology class. Um, I am s uh, specifically interested in uh, psychological disorders right now. So a lot of mood disorders and depersonalization, derealization, psychosis, a lot of different things. Um, but I want the future to look like people reframing how they look at what protection of a community looks like. So I really want to like encourage people to imagine like new job roles within the mental health community that can help reconstruct what the role of mental health professionals can actually end up doing that will actually hopefully benefit a lot of these horrible um, situations that the police have really brought into our communities. Um, I really hope and trying to I try to envision um, a role that requires defense training that doesn't involve needing a lethal weapon um, when a professional is asked to come into a crisis and kind of come into um, these, these kind of more scary moments. You know, people can get, get violent with psychosis and multiple uh, personality disorder and all of these other disorders. So it is important to have someone who is equipped for violent situations, but I would encourage people to see what it looks like to not use a fucking lethal weapon on anyone in these situations. <laughs> that sounds fair. Sounds very fair. Thank you, Claire. All right. Two more people. When was the first time you felt community amongst your community? Like, when was the first time you felt it? Like, really? Thank you. Hi, my name is Jen. Um, I had my answer right when he asked, and I just was being quiet. Um, the first time I felt community within my community was um, when I was getting ready to move into uh, my first home in Northeast Minneapolis, and then when I moved into the home, my home in Northeast, Northeast Minneapolis, and I've been there for 29 years in that house. Um, you know, I was 29, I'm 56 now, um, so that was a long time ago. And uh, we would come over to fix up the house and paint and neighbors would come by and, you know, check in. How are the kids doing? We can't wait for you get to get here and to bring your kids. And, and that was so nice. I actually became friends with two of the neighbor ladies who had little kids that couldn't wait to have the kids moving in with us. And one was our move in date. And then when we did move in, the morning that we woke up in the house, um, our neighbors right next door who are a really elderly couple, probably in their 70s, you know, I was, that was elderly to me back then, left um, warm caramel rolls and 
right? I mean, right? And a fresh thing of squeezed orange juice. And I don't really remember, you know what, we didn't have probably cell phones back then. So I think we woke up in the morning and didn't really know it was there. And then there was a note, you know, um, on the door that said, welcome to the neighborhood. And that was so nice. So that's the first time um, I really felt that. And then what do you want, like, like, do you want people to do, like, that, that's like, obviously an act of generosity. And when we talk about other things, like, like, you know, stolen lives from the community, it's like the opposite of generosity. It's an act of violence. What do you want from your community going down the road in regards to generosity versus police violence? Well, for sure, like, that's, that's just a great idea to kind of start reinstating that stuff. You know, like, right now I was thinking, sitting there, we have two houses up for sale. And I don't remember the last time I've ever gone over to meet a neighbor across the street. I know that I'm, I know most of them. Do the cops ever come and like say hi to what? people or meet people in you the neighborhood? What? They do not. And um, uh, um, honestly, we don't have a lot of cops coming into Northeast Minneapolis. Okay. You know, on, I mean, that's just being the truth. I mean, we don't have a lot of cops rolling through our neighborhood. But I would like to see us, you know, reach out and um, get to know our neighbors genuinely, like everybody's talking about. And maybe that starts when they first move in. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we'll take one more person. One more person. One more. Yeah, yeah, yeah go again. Yeah, yeah. Why not? Well, first of all, y'all, I just want to say if I cough, it's because I got my dad's fall allergies, not because of COVID. But, <coughs> um, <coughs> so... I guess I just wanted to kind of tie stuff together because I've been really involved in mutual aid since everything began too. I've been doing food distro stuff over at the Seward Cafe in South. And I guess hearing everybody's stories and observing all this stuff and being a part of some of those uh, online mutual aid networks, it really seems like we're doing a better job than the city is. And I guess that's really distressing to me. It's a good thing. It gives me a lot of hope for the community, but it's sad. Uh, and I guess we talked about, you know, the issue of homelessness, and obviously that's a whole other can of worms to open, but it's just disgusting to me the way that the city has handled that and evicting encampments and stuff, um, especially considering the fact that there are all these people who are, you know, out there literally every day trying to make sure that they have food, trying to make sure they have clothes. Um, and it's immensely important. So I guess just like... Looking forward, it seems like at best the cops are a boys, boys club and at worst they're a mafia. And like, I don't know, I feel like uh, we as a community really need to, you know, look at, at going forward the power that we have. And I think that civilian control is absolutely not optional. It's something that needs to happen because, I don't know, they don't represent our interests. A lot of them don't even live here and we do live here and we feel the rhythm and the pulse of this city and we know the people so well, yeah. while, while we have you here you mentioned something interesting about the boys club at, at worst the mafia and, yeah. and evicting on house folks <clears throat> we're going to pivot here towards the end of this conversation we're going to last 10 minutes we're going to spend on this and very quickly people can speak speak to this you gave how you know uh, uh testimonies of how you want your community to look even some people went into policing how a wellness check should look i'm i'm curious as we're pivoting into this we talk about qualified immunity uh indemnification and a statute of limitations. These are all things that are huge uh, shields for police, especially qualified immunity. Um, when you talk about police going into parks and evicting unhoused folks, what do you want the future to be for police? And you said something, it's sad how the city is handling it. What do you want the future to be for police? And how would you like them to show up to places like unhoused encampments, places like impoverished neighborhoods places like neighborhoods with mostly people of color how would you like them to show up if at all well i was going to say ideally not showing up to encampments at all but um no i think that's a really excellent question uh and i guess i think that you know so much of it is the system that produces cops right i have a friend who she uh went through the cadet program but she actually quit because of all the harassment and racism and stuff she kind of had the idea that she would change the system from the inside but she really felt like that wasn't possible and i guess hearing about you know all of the training that they go through and the way that they're really made to feel paranoid about these communities that they're coming into i think that 
either there needs to be some sort of full abolition and rebuilding, or there has to be a serious one-to-one -one dialogue between the community and the police officers themselves so that they understand I, how much distress they're putting people in. They probably do. I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Um, so, so quickly, like several more people, what do you want the police to look like, if anything at all, in your community? And if they are there, would we change the word police? What to? What do you want the future of policing to look like in your community, if at all? Come up and tell us. And I'm also curious to see what different words people would come up with other than police. Like, you know, community coalition. I, I, don't, I don't know. Like, it, it gets creative at this point. Hey, uh, my name's Mick. Um, well, I think something that's really important um, are the statistics that show that a lot of police officers, a majority of them, don't live in the communities that they're supposed to protect um, and serve. And so they kind of view themselves as this kind of outside controlling force. And I think that's a really huge problem because if you're not living in, in the community that you're supposed to be serving, you're not familiar with the people in it. You're not familiar with the struggles and the problems that they're facing the history um, and that type of thing. So I think a huge thing that needs to change is you need to live in these communities if you're supposed to be the, the protectors. And I think that is kind of the primary purpose. Your, your job is to protect um, as opposed to invade, which is what it feels like a lot of the time. Do you think um, things would change if they were living in the community? I think it would, because if you, if you have to go to the same grocery store and go to the same gas station and see the people every day that, you're, that you interact with, you form relationships and you form bonds with people. Would you change the name of the police to something else if they were to, to be help more beholden to the community? Yeah, I think community would be in the name. It'd be like community, um, I don't know, you know, community outreach uh, organization or something. Okay. You know? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? What, what do you want the future of policing to look like? Yeah, Brixton, go ahead. Uh, well, MPD is one thing. Um, but sometimes I think we could kind of do an end around through the park police and transform the park police into a park service. And because people kind of expect something different from a park ranger than they expect from a police officer. And there's a lot of park buildings that are woefully underused that I think you could use to be like a center point in because they're spread out all over the city. There's parkland. And I think they control something like 11% of the ground surface area in the city. So they reach a lot of neighborhoods. And if you could have that be the place you went to to get your social services or to do something that doesn't involve armed personnel showing up, and maybe they're a little less defensive than the MPD. So maybe transforming the park police into a model system that could just kind of subsume MPD after a while. Uh, that's one of the visions that I have is park rangers instead of park police. So literally get rid of like city police and like have the park police formulate into a new group like the, the, the land rangers and basically take over the city police. Yeah, except you, you, you're putting it in like these militaristic terms. I like to see it like build a parallel system. And then as this parallel system is working better, it's just not so important to have the police anymore. You know it's what I'm hard. saying instead of like crashing the police and then trying to rebuild something yeah. in their place, build something else and make them obsolete. Okay, build something else and make them obsolete. I mean, they're not going to go away. Just you they know, could. They, well, they could. Yeah, they're, they're going to go away fighting though. That's the big problem with. Yeah, no, that um, is that, that's very true. And, and we I wanted to ask Dave or Michelle later on what that fight would look like as we wrap up. We got a little, it's a little bit more time here. Yeah, do you want to go ahead? Thank you, Brixton. What do you want for the future of policing in your community? And would you change the word of policing for that future? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely in a perfect world, I would love to abolish the police. Um, and I think that we could get there someday. Um, for now, what I would w want them to do, stuff so they could take right now, like this month, is to start showing some compassion start talking to the families that have been impacted by police violence and listening, not going there to talk and, and say what the law is, but coming as a human being 
So that's one thing that they can start doing is actually start coming in to our community and having these conversations with us um, and listening to us and like, you know, vowing, you know, that they're gonna hold their other police partners accountable and they're not gonna be a fraternity that only looks out for one another. It's not an us versus them. And it's been like this this whole time. Yeah. And another thing is that police was built off of racism. Yeah. They were built off of slave patrol. Yeah. Like, why would we wanna keep that around? I, in the fact that if we rename it, it can still be the same thing. Police are d designed that what they're doing now, it's their job. Yeah. Like, it's not like this is like, oh, like this is so bad, like they're killing black people, but, but this is what they were told to be doing since the 1800s. Yeah. So we do need to rebuild. Um, if, I, if, if it were up to me, we would change, you know, not the name, but we would change the whole organization. We would defund them and there would be 60% less and they would be community uh, servant officers because they're serving our community. I want to go back to panelists real quick and wrap up. So, Jay, w w what would you, w I, I once heard you say at a march, there was a world before policing and there will be a world after it. What, what do you see in that world after policing and Obviously, I'm finding that you can't just change the name. I mean, I, I could see like somebody being like, wow, slave patrol sounds really rough. Let's just call them police, yeah. you know? <laughs> and now they're doing the same thing. Close to what happened. Yeah, but basically, what, what, would, you, what would you change about the, the direction of police and what does the world uh, look like uh, beyond policing? Um, I think that first of all, what, what people sometimes forget about the police is that they're also um, agents of the state that specifically take people out of the community to work in prisons. Like they, they are specifically designed to provide prison labor as well. They are a tool of capitalism. It's not just about them being in your neighborhood and, you know, harassing folks and, and, you know, that stuff, obviously terrible, but you also have to remember that they have a vested interest in taking as many people as they can get and funneling them into that system. Um, and so to me, a world without police also has to be a world without prisons. Um, it has to be a world, um, if not without prisons entirely, because, you know, there are still terrible people and, you know, what do we do with them? Um, right. But like it, you can't you can't get rid of police and then still have like these basically plantations where people are just essentially disappeared to. Um, and mental and mental health facilities are are similar in that they they are also a place where people who are considered too problematic to live in the community um, and too expensive um, to to take care of are also funneled into that as well. And so I think I think to me it's also about reimagining like what a criminal is and reimagining what criminal behavior actually is. Is it actually criminal? under capitalism to steal from a major corporation mm. that's been hoarding wealth your whole life is that is that stealing or is it wealth redistribution is it really is vandalism really that much of a problem when the company that's supposedly being vandalized has a backlog of millions of dollars to pay for that damage and they've been and they're paying for that with your money with money from the community and they're paying for that with with wage theft i mean is that, like why is wage theft not not a crime um and so i think that to me it's about reimagining what a criminal offense is and how we deal with with criminality um we have to completely change our framework for that is is my answer i was discussing this and i just really quick want to ask you this jay you make up you bring up so many great points what is one of the uh, speaking about this is one of my favorite people what is one of the longest standing institutions next to prison? Prison is a very historically old institution in the US. What's another one that's as old as that? Hmm. I'd probably say banks. Nailed it, nailed it. Goodness, you, yeah, banks and prisons. And when you think about that and you're speaking about wage theft and then they're using your money to clean up your vandalism and, and maybe reimagining theft as wealth redistribution, that, that 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 that's enlightening just to hear and also to know that the two some of the two oldest institutions in this country are prisons and banks that kind of lets you know what 
what what what the entirety of like like the the plantation and the new imagination of it in prison labor is about. So thank you for bringing that up, Loretta. Do you want to speak to to the final question here? What what um, what do you want? What do you see as a world beyond policing? I think where everyone's basic needs are being taken care of. We live in a we live in this country where it's a shame that during a global pandemic there was they show food li lines for food district for food pantries a mile long in car people lined up a long mile long in cars to get boxes of food mm. we're the richest country in the world and we can't even feed people we can't even ensure that you can that you can go to the hospital and not leave with a bill worth thousands of dollars um our schools are woefully it are woefully underfunded um and in that i mean i i'm a public school teacher and i can tell i can tell you the frustrations i have it, 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 I, I have more frustrations with distance learning but when i was in the brit when we were face to face there were even you you saw it firsthand you know and so it's to me policing a world beyond policing is our basic needs are met police are necessary in this world now because no one's basic needs are being met mm. and so and so it's it, and so people think they're safer with police because there's so much going on i mean we're like right now they're um we're dealing with an uptick in gun violence and people are thinking we need more police to quell that but the problem is they're they're part of the problem they're they're part of that problem i mean um what sunday with those three boys who got killed in that, that high-speed chase the police didn't need to chase those kids that car would have they eventually would have abandoned that car they would have had their fun and and then left that car right but instead that car was more important than those three boys lives and it's and that's not right and so my thing is if and and you know and the demand of those families was there needs to be more things for the youth if basic needs were taken care of there would be no need for for police because everyone would have what they need and everyone would have we would have very great funded schools i would be paid more as a teacher I'm I'm just gonna put that, that I'm that. I'm gonna put that out there. I need more fucking money to raise my family. I'm teaching people's kids and I can barely take care of myself. We uh and you know and and the thing and all the other things would happen. We wouldn't have the wage theft. We wouldn't have all that because everyone's basic needs would be taken care of. And that's what I see. And I mean and I and we shouldn't have to we shouldn't have to beg for that. That should be happening. So that's that's how I see it. Okay, Michelle, I'm going to take you to just a real quick task here if you're okay with that. So okay. it's, it, we gotta, we got to wrap up pretty quickly here. We do. I do want to talk a little bit about an, a European model that I'm aware of. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I spent a lot of time in Ireland, uh, quite a bit of time. And um, there, what they have is they have ombuds. And ombuds are people that um, basically are put in these communities. Like, you know, you can live in a little neighborhood and there's an ombuds person in that neighborhood that's paid and they just have an office and you show up and you say i'm having problems with my insurance i'm having problems with my unemployment or i just lost my job and i need some help or i'm running low on food in my family and they find solutions they don't rely in these towns and these little communities so much on cops reining people in and all this crap you know they find solutions and as a result they have a lot less cops and by the way their cops don't carry guns there either so okay. i think that that you know one of the things that I know is at this time, I don't think we're quite ready to do away with police because there's all these other systems that connect to policing, like the court system. If you're a victim of violence, um, you have to rely on the court system to try to get that violence to stop, like say somebody had domestic abuse. Um, and the way that people access the court system is through an investigation by a law enforcement agency. And so we, until we change those other things, we can't really quite get rid of police, but we sure as hell can reduce our reliance on them in a big way. And I think through some of these kinds of things like an ombuds or things of that nature, you know, gets us closer to that goal. So re really quickly, just, just, just rapid fire, qualified immunity, how do we get rid of it? That's a U.S. Supreme Court, in, uh, uh, invent, uh, what's the word, invent, uh, invention. 
And um, But what we can do is we can get rid of it, but we will have to probably get rid of it through U.S. Congress. Some states are taking some legislation. Um, there's Like Colorado recently passed legislation that killed qualified immunity in that state. A few other states have done it too. It would be great if we could get it to happen here. But our legislature is so crappy here that I don't see that happening. So I think we have to work hard. There are a number of bills in front of the U.S. Um, you know, Congress that we can push, and I think those are going to be the way we end up getting rid of qualified immunity. Police it's having personal liability insurance, how do we get it? Hell yeah! <laughs> that's, our, that's our thing we've been pushing for years. Um, how do we get it? The way we're going to have to get it right now is probably through the legislature at this point. State legislature? State legislature. But man, you know, if you put cops, if you make cops assume the, the risk for their own conduct, their damn conduct's going to improve, okay? Indemnification. <laughs> Uh, how, how do we how do we end indemnification? Well, it's the same thing. Uh, indemnification is the city assuming the risk for the cops without having to pay for an insurance policy. So when a civil suit goes through and they pay twelve million dollars or twenty million dollars or two hundred thousand dollars, that's We're from the city. For it. Yeah, We're paying which for it. means We're paying which means taxpayers. So indemnification okay. ending it would mean that the police pay for it. Well, you have to have somebody pay for it. Okay, you got to have a way because look, people that are harmed by the police deserve to get funds for the harm that they had yeah. we don't want to just make it where nobody can ever sue the cops hell that really won't rein the cops in we've got to have it so that people that get harmed have a way to get some recompense for that harm but they should have to have insurance policies or things like that what we do now in minneapolis we actually budget 21 million dollars a year for police misconduct in this town literally we are budgeting for police brutality and i think that's appalling Wow. We should require these cops to carry their own professional liability insurance, and then it's on their asses if they mess up. Okay, last thing before you go off on, on kind of end wrap up. Yep. Let's say there's a new mayor that's voted in in 2021 for Minneapolis. What's I think one that's almost a guarantee, don't you all? <laughs> okay, don't count your chickens. I mean, <laughs> just when I think things are going good, you know, I got to knock on something. Uh, but So let's say a new mayor comes in for Minneapolis for 2021. What is one thing? And, and I know we've all been setting the bar low, but what's one thing you want them to follow through on? Put into place an accountability mechanism that actually works right now. What's an and accountability mechanism? Something like, um, something like community control of the police. You know, something where it's the community that decides what conduct is acceptable by these police and that uh, addresses the conduct that's not acceptable and that holds these damn cops accountable. So I think the first thing they got to do is put police accountability right on the table on a real mechanism, not this garbage we have right now with the OPCR. Okay. Before we, before we wrap up, and this is this is the final this is the final forum, and and just real quick as we kind of like conclude here, uh, Communities United Against Police Brutality has a ton of information over there that you should latch on to, screenshot. Post to your Instagram and Facebook. Everybody needs to see that information. And two, what we do at on site, as you see uh, Max there, who's, who's kind of just, just shuddering in the darkness, uh, has these cameras up. What we do is we film any form that you want us to do. So we turn the cameras over to the community. Anything that you want us to film and then edit, put together as a form or whatever, we will do that. And as long as it's uplifting and informative of a community, uh, so that's what we're here for as well. What, what would you like to conclude on? Um, well, um, this Sunday at uh, yep, this Sunday at two o'clock in North Commons Park, we are going to do a kind of a little Q and A information about uh, community control, um, CPAC, and our legislation. And we'd love for you all to come out, tell your friends, tell your neighbors. Um, we're trying to get this off the ground in Minneapolis, um, and hopefully. You know, and, uh, and um, I forgot to mention earlier that the other cities are are, try are trying to do this too. We are uh, modeling a lot of our stuff from Chicago. Chicago has been working at it for several years, and um, and they were able to even get pe people who were running for aldermen to say that they support community control. Um, they didn't support that alderman though. They just said <laughs> you you are going to support this. We're not going to work on your campaign, but you're going to say in your campaign you support community control. And so, um, so yeah, so that's what, you know, we, that's what our hope is. And we would like to have way more people and people with a lot of skill sets to help us with this. So, 
Okay. And also tomorrow at 6 p.m., 38th in Chicago, is Theater in the Square. And it's, desi it's space designated for uh, black, indigenous, and people of color uh, to perform at the Speedway. So you'll just see, see folks uh, that are just doing theater in the square uh, in an autonomous zone that has 24 demands that all relate to justice. Um, otherwise, they don't bring the barriers up, which I think everybody should get informed on, which is really, really key. Jay. Um, yeah, I think just echoing what Loretta had to say, um, specifically that, you know, if even if you think that you don't have, you know, a mind for legalese or you aren't a good reader or whatever, like there is something that everyone can bring to this fight. Um, and I think that it's everyone's duty to bring something to this fight. Um, so I just want to encourage everyone to, to get involved in this, in TCC for J, in CUAPB, um, to just do something because like we have to get something done <laughs> exactly and getting involved is the first step and, and and michelle and tcc for j have some amazing they're consistent everything's happening weekly right you have weekly meetings all the time so you can always attend one of those and thank you so much for coming out today and tonight uh we appreciate that and for spending the time with these forums and hearing people out they will not stop here this isn't the end we're going to uh, give all the raw footage to CUAPB, to transcript, and then you'll see edits of this coming out sooner than later. So, yeah. Great. And I just want to say again, thank you for being here. Um, we are going to be putting this together. We have online a form. There's a link to it on our website that if you kind of feel like, oh, I just don't like to speak in public, but I have something to say, but I'm a little too nervous to say it in public or whatever, please give your testimony online. We've picked up a number of good testimonies online, and they're very helpful. Talk about your experience in the immediate aftermath of the killing of George Floyd. Talk about your experience before George Floyd was killed that you think contributed to the climate that allowed him to be killed. Talk about whatever it is that you want to talk about related to this. And like I said, we've got that form right on um, our website. You can click that. You can enter your written testimony. We are delighted to take that because we want to document the experiences people had in this city and we want to use that and learn from those experiences. You know, the value of, of you testifying is not just so we can all kind of bear our souls, but it's so we can learn from this stuff. And we're going to put this together in a report and, um, you know, distribute it widely so that we can, again, learn and see that we have a way forward together. And so thank you all so much for your amazing contributions to this effort. We greatly appreciate it. We really do.